know Stacy's been working on a video. Oh, we'll talk later. <laughs> That one's done. Yes, we do. I, I signed in earlier. Cool. Here we go. Yep. And does this work? Yep. Task one, two. Oh my goodness, this is working. Well, hello everybody. Good to see you again. Um, it's uh, it is time to uh, take the next step in our journey uh, towards understanding um, race and housing in Metro Detroit uh, through the last uh, number of decades. And Des Squire is here to my right. A round of applause for Des here. She is an attorney and she is the curator of this exhibit that you see around us. Uh, for those of you who were not here last time, it begins rather uh, easily uh, as you enter our uh, fellowship hall from the hallway. Uh, these are all uh, standalone. Uh, I'm going to try to do this. Oh, I'm going to put them on my phone. There you go. Exhibits that, uh, and, and Des tells me she's going to work on this herself. Um, these are all standalone exhibits that allow you to. Um, Get a greater understanding of the uh, of the issue, um, and so we begin with the Great Migration. And as you walk around the uh, the room, you get to see different uh, aspects of, uh, of of really housing policy and uh, the um, the really uh, sad repercussions it's had on our area, on on our lives as human beings uh, when we see such inequality and, and inequity. Uh, you can see those of you here in the parish hall, you can see the screen share with uh, Peter Hammer Esquire. Uh, Peter and I, how, Peter, how long have we known each other? Probably around six or eight years or so. Yes, indeed. And Peter is the, um, uh, he runs the, uh, the Damon Keith Law Center down at uh, Wayne State University. You can see uh, a picture of Damon Keith, um, really an, an outsized uh, force in, in terms of justice and racial justice and housing justice here. In, um, in Metro Detroit. And so, uh, Peter, we're so excited that you're with us today. Uh, we are hosting five of these Sundays throughout the month of October. And uh, last week we heard from Des who walked us through this illustrious exhibit that's around me here. And uh, today we are really humbled and really, uh, really honored, Peter, to have you with us to really unpack a term that we all hear thrown around, which is white flight. Oh, we all know what that is. Um, but you know, like a lot of terms um, around this issue, uh, it is deep. And so uh, I would like to just simply ask uh, those of you uh, who are on Zoom, get your icon with hands together ready. And those of you here, put your hands together for Peter Hammer and Peter will give it to you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I first want to just say welcome. I want to welcome uh, and say thank you for uh, St. David's uh, community uh, and parish for welcoming into to your household, even though it's virtual. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you to, to Des and the Michigan Roundtable for doing this good work on the housing exhibit of We Don't Want Them. Um, and I'm going to pull up a, a PowerPoint uh, and walk you through a, a sort of an analysis of a series of slides of the way that white flight has resegregated the region. It's not a, an issue of the past. It's certainly an issue of the present and an issue of the, the future. Uh, I'll speak for about 20 minutes. I don't have any time constraints, so I'm happy to go past 12 if that's what the, the, the body wants. Because uh, I do think it's important to have discussion and Q&A. So wait with me as I pull up the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll start from the beginning. If the technology wants me to. All right. And then I move your faces over here <laughs> out of the way. Uh, and I always like to, as, as, as Father Chris suggested, uh, pay homage to, to Judge Damon J. Keith, the namesake of our center. And, and we need heroes uh, in troubled times. And in many ways, these are troubled times. And I can't think of a, a better hero than Judge Keith. Uh, and this is a, a, the cover to a copy of his biography, uh, Crusader for Justice. But I'm going to start with a provocative claim and try to put this issue of white flight uh, into perspective as really being one of the more important dynamics uh, that underlies the sets of issues that we're struggling to face today. Uh, and the claim is that the name George Floyd has come to symbolize the cumulative effects of some 400 years of racism in America. 
Uh, and then as we think about Detroit and the country today, we're facing dual pandemics. There certainly is a pandemic of police brutality, uh, and there's also a pandemic of the racially disparate impact of the COVID-19 uh, 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 virus. Uh, but these are all interrelated, and it, and it revolves largely around issues of housing, or at least the story can be told 80, 90 percent through housing. But when you think about COVID is the intersection between spatial structural racism and policies of fiscal austerity. And when you think about police brutality as the intersection between racism uh, and forms of, of sort of fear and militarism coming together. Uh, but unfortunately, our society teaches almost nothing about these concepts. Uh, and we always have to question why. Why aren't we given better frames? Why don't we have better understandings? Why indeed is racism often uh, hiding in plain sight? And that's not a new insight, right? You can go back to Ralph Ellison's book, The Invisible Man, and that was the primary theme. But we also have to see that European Americans and Euro Americans of color are situated very differently when it comes to understanding and seeing racism. Uh, European Americans, uh, uh, like myself, uh, are trained and socialized since birth not to see the racism that exists. Uh, and there's a wonderful field called the epistemology of ignorance, right? Epistemology is the theory of knowledge and we need that. But if we're really gonna understand spatial structural racism and the dynamics of white flight, we also have to have a theory of ignorance. Uh, and a subfield of that is white ignorance. Uh, and a wonderful resource for that is Charles Mill's book, The Racial Contract. In contrast, Americans of color confront and experience racism almost every day of their lives, right? Uh, Judge Keith would often say that there wasn't a day in his life uh, in some way, great or small, that he was not made aware that he was a black man uh, in America. Uh, and that's coming from one of the greatest jurists that this country has ever produced. So what are some of the implications? Well, one implication is that European Americans like myself need to be on a lifelong journey of unlearning much of what we've been taught and relearning how to see again, right? It also means that the knowledge and expertise of Americans of color need to be centered, honored, and respected. If you wanted to build a bridge, you would not go to a civil engineer that did not see uh, gravity, right? And in a very similar fashion, if you want to confront spatial structural racism, you don't go to somebody who doesn't see color. Right? Uh, and we can talk further about that in the Q&A. But the illustration that I want us to go through is seeing, do we understand the dynamics of spatial structural racism? Do we see and understand the dynamics of spatial racism that defines almost every aspect of Detroit metropolitan area? And it is white flight that is the physics that has segregated the city and then resegregated the region. Uh, and I wanna go through an exercise first to step back for a minute and really try to get you to appreciate how unnatural segregation is, right? And one way I do that is to ask, what if people were gas molecules? Right? And if you hearken back to your uh, 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 high school chemistry class, if you talk to your sons or grandsons or granddaughters, uh, they would have been recently told that gas molecules in a very short period of time uh, are uniformly distributed in space. Right? And that means if I brought five gas molecules into the parish hall in a relatively short period of time, no matter where I was taking my sample, I would be getting the same distribution of gas molecules. Right? And we know, sadly, that people do not act like gas molecules. And therefore, we can ask, what are the social, the economic, the political forces that shape demographic patterns and that keep us from acting like gas molecules? Right? Uh, and there's mantras that are useful to try to, to, to take home with you. Right? And one of those mantras I want you to take home with you is to continually think about the spatialization of race and the racialization of space. Right? The spatialization of race and the racialization of space and how that influences any drive you take uh, through Southeast Michigan. And my contention is if we really understand how to see things again or accurately, we're going to start finding archaeological evidence of spatial structural racism almost everywhere we look. Right? Uh, and there's resources, right? There's James Lowen's book, Sundown Towns. Uh, there's George Lipset books, How Racism Takes Place. Uh, there's lots of additional resources that we can go to if you want to continue this journey. But I want to start the journey uh, with an exercise of, of, of trying to define and understand and see graphically uh, the reality of spatial racism in Southeast Michigan. And then we'll back into that the role that white flight uh, uh, over decades has played to create this resegregation. Right? And again, we have to thank the Michigan Roundtable uh, who produced these opportunity maps 
But opportunity mapping is, is exactly what you think it would be, right? It's intuitive. Uh, opportunity is, is the quality of housing, right? Uh, the quality and availability of good jobs, the quality of schools, right? Access to public and private health care, uh, access to public and private transportation, uh, whether or not you can buy fresh fruits and vegetables and nutritious fruits or foods in a, in a relatively easy way. Uh, and more broadly, the quality of the, of the living environment. So I'll ask everybody to take a deep breath, right? And to go through this exercise with me. Think about where there's areas of high opportunity, right? Uh, think about where there's areas of low opportunity in Southeast Michigan, right? And pretend you're up in the space station and you look down at Southeast Michigan and all you can see is the presence or absence of opportunity, right? And in your mind's eye, I want you to paint areas of high opportunity in dark, rich colors. Right? And in your mind's eye, I want you to paint areas of low opportunity uh, in light, pale colors, right? Uh, so you have your own vision in your mind, and I'm going to show you the map that was created by uh, the Kerwin Institute commissioned by uh, the Michigan Roundtable. And if you look at my cursor, right, uh, you could see from outer space this area of low opportunity, right? Uh, but that area of low opportunity has a geopolitical name. And once I situate that name, you're going to see and understand the entire map. So that opportunity desert, right, visible from outer space is Pontiac. Uh, but we know that Oakland County is one of the richest counties in the country historically. So we have another why question. Why do I have a, an opportunity desert surrounded by a sea of opportunity? And if I come down further south, I could almost see the demarcation of Eight Mile as a demarcation of the presence and absence of opportunity. But we also know in Wayne counties, there's the gross points, right? Areas of high opportunity. So again, we have that question at a regional level why is there high opportunity in some areas and low opportunity in others? And from mapping like this, we can demonstrate pretty conclusively that there's a high degree of segregation of wealth and opportunity in Southeast Michigan. The next map is going to overlay demographic data and is gonna be a story in black and white, and you're gonna see green dots. And the green dots will represent a predominant African-American communities by census tract. Right? Uh, and this is what it looks like when I overlay uh, a story of race and a story of opportunity uh, in Southeast Michigan. And I'm going to toggle back and forth, right? But we see that there's not only a segregation of wealth and opportunity in Southeast Michigan, there's a segregation of race, wealth, and opportunity in Southeast Michigan. Uh, and that's what we call spatial racism, right? And, and the metropolitan area is really one of the ground zeros of spatial structural racism in this country. Uh, and I sometimes say that we have to view ourselves as living in the new Selma. But I always pause at this point of the presentation and want to remind people that this is a story of systems and not, and not individuals, right? So this is a story of systems and not individuals. What that presence or absence of opportunity is really measuring are the multiple infrastructures necessary to create opportunity, right? Uh, what's the political infrastructure? What's the economic infrastructure? What's the social infrastructure necessary to produce opportunity or to die opportunity? So what this map actually represents is decades of disinvestment socially and collectively within the infrastructures necessary to create opportunity. And what this map shows us is that there's a differential impact uh, along racial lines about those that are provided opportunity infrastructures and those that are denied. Uh, opportunity infrastructures. And once we start to realize the implications of that map, it affects every single social policy issue that you could care about. Uh, it influences the quality of education, the quality of jobs, who has access to a car, who does not, who gets to be able to get on a bus, who does not, whether there's municipal distress or emergency management or not. It influences life expectancy, right? The very essence of life. It influences childhood obesity and maternal mortality. Uh, and infant mortality, right? Uh, it influences police brutality and mass incarceration. It influences everything, right? Uh, and I would imagine that those not familiar with the Michigan Roundtable's work haven't seen that map, right? And then I have my favorite question again, why, right? Why isn't this map on the evening news, right? Why isn't this map in the, uh, the, the free press and the Detroit news, right? And we go back to that notion of the epistemology of ignorance, right? To maintain 
these unequal systems, we actually have to very consciously construct ignorance of their very existence, right? We have to ignore that archeological evidence of spatial structural racism uh, that I mentioned earlier. But how did this happen, right? How did this happen that in uh, 2021, we still live in one of the most segregated communities in the country? At the key center, we talk about a co-evolution of systemic inequality as reflecting a dialectic of belief systems and institutions, right? Racialized belief systems create racialized institutional structures that reproduce themselves over time, right? And we have to start understanding that dynamic process of which white flight played a critical role in, in creating a system where we used to have racial segregation at a neighborhood level inside of cities like Detroit. And today we have the reproduction of that racial segregation at a regional level where entire cities are now functioning as racialized space, right? And white flight is the physics that get you from one story to the other story. So I'm gonna show you a series of maps now, right? Uh, and we're gonna sort of do this phased analysis over time, but I wanna start uh, with this notion of redlining, right? And, and, and many people may be sitting there and holding some level of tension or discomfort, uh, and that's okay, right? Uh, these issues inherently bring up trauma uh, and tension and discomfort. Uh, and one of the skills of doing racial equity work is learning how to live uh, and work with that tension, all right? But this is redlining. Uh, and the red areas where it gets his name uh, are areas where the federal government intentionally said, uh, we will not have any uh, lending, right? And, and this was the creation of this 30 year federally subsidized loan that made access to housing finally available to average Americans, right? But they said it will not be available if you're black. Right? It was an expressly racialized system. They not only just said it would not be available if you're black, they said it will not be available if there is of, of, of a sufficiently large number or any African-Americans within the neighborhood that a white person wanted to buy into, right? And this was federal policy. And the claim that you'll see by the end of these series of maps, you'll see that that map didn't go anywhere, right? That map still determines who has opportunity and who does not, right? And that map still determines uh, whether or not you're gonna have the comorbid comorbidities that are associated uh, with uh, a higher incidence of, 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 of death uh, with the COVID disease, right? This map still controls our present. This map still controls uh, our future. But let's now tell the story through, again, a whole series of census maps. We'll do it at the Detroit level, then we'll do it at the regional level. Uh, this is, again, Detroit, right, 1930. Uh, and the darker green shows predominant African-American census tracts, right? And you very clearly see uh, hyper-segregation in the city of Detroit, uh, in 1930, but the segregation is taking place on a neighborhood by neighborhood level. Right? Uh, people are not acting like gas molecules, right? And we're gonna see that throughout this analysis. So we go from the 1930s to the 1940s and think about what's happening, the same physics at the same time, that great migration, all of these people coming in black and white to get better jobs in the North. Uh, and it starts to expand, but expand only on the edges. And this is 1950. Uh, and I want to go to a separate map that shows density, right? So we have all of these people flowing in. Uh, we have all of these forces, political, economic, uh, and often physically violent forces documented in the uh, we don't want them exhibit, keeping black people in neighborhoods, right? Uh, this line here, uh, where you see kind of the, the, the tannish colors represents density, right? And so we see the highest density in 1950 uh, was along an area called Hastings Street, right? Uh, and it represents densities typically associated with uh, high-rise uh, uh, multifamily residential uh, uh, structures, right? But we also know that those don't exist in Detroit. So that density is taking place by dividing house and dividing a house and dividing a house and putting more and more people into housing structures that was already uh, some of the lower quality uh, in the city, right? Uh, and then what did the planners do in the name of economic development? Uh, they put I-75, right? right down the most racially segregated and highly dense portion of the city uh, of Detroit, right? And again, we start to see these linkage of policies. Uh, and every time you drive down I-75, you can view that uh, in some ways as archeological evidence uh, of spatial structural racism and remember what was there before I-75. 
But again, the story continues in the 1960s, we already have substantial breaching of those whole historic lines. Uh, and the people that are moving out, and we'll show this at the regional level, uh, is the very definition of white flight that we're gonna be talking about. And I'll tell you that this is happening long before uh, the rebellion of 1967. Right? And so again, part of the belief system, the mythologies, the racialized mythology uh, in the region, that white flight is only associated uh, as a response to the 67 rebellion. 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and you have now the entire city of Detroit functioning as a as, as, as segregated space within a segregated region. And we've gone from segregation being a neighborhood phenomenon to segregation being a regional and citywide phenomenon. Um, all right, deep breath again, and I want to now migrate us to a regional perspective. Right? One reality is that we live in one of the most balkanized regions in the country. Right? Uh, and by that, I mean there are more small cities, townships uh, in southeast Michigan, relatively, than almost anywhere else in the country. And it's almost impossible to change boundary lines. The boundaries of the city of Detroit have not changed since 1926, right? almost a century. Uh, this map reminds us that growth took place over time. In many places where you are living now, uh, there was no uh, suburb, right? That was cornfield, right? That was uh, wooded uh, 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 wetlands, right? Uh, and now it is white suburban space. And that took place over time, right? Uh, so we resituate ourselves in Detroit in 1950, and that's what it looked like. We take that same map and put it at a regional level. And now we're gonna tell the story of white flight and regional resegregation uh, at a regional level. And I want you to focus on two sets of things when you look at these maps. One thing is the green versus the yellow, right? And that's a story of black and white and white flight and resegregation. The other thing is just the absence or presence of roads, right? Again, in 1950s, we didn't have that infrastructure. So look at the density of roads as part of a measure of that expanding region, uh, which was also the, the roads that, that enabled the white flight and the resegregation. So 1950, right? 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, and then we get to 2000 and that map of spatial racism, right? And again, as I said before, that affects any social policy issue that you could possibly care about, right? And it didn't go away, right? The report now, the roots of structural racism, 21st century residential segregation in the United States published just a few months ago, uh, establishes again, that linkage between redlining and the resegregation at a regional level that we see today. Uh, a report that came out last year by the National uh, uh, Community Reinvestment Coalition, Redlining and Neighborhood Health, documents that those red line areas in the 1930s are associated with higher levels of social vulnerability today. And those higher levels of social vulnerability uh, are highly co correlated with the comorbidities uh, that give us higher rates of, of illness and death uh, along racial lines uh, in the United States in Detroit today. Right? Uh, so pausing a bit, right, we can start at least to reflect, and this is gonna be a, a, a not an easy uh, a question to answer, but what can we do today, right? And at the Keith Center, we often talk about the three R's and the three R's are race, regionalism and reconciliation. Right? So what do we do to disrupt this reproduction of cycles of oppression? What can you do as an individual level, right? What can you do as a parish uh, in order to make the future uh, better than we've had in the past and not to reproduce uh, the systems of oppression that we've inherited uh, and to build a better future that Judge Keith and many of you and your congregation uh, are dreaming of. So thank you. I'm going to take it off screen share. We're going to return ourselves to a community, right? Uh, and then I'm happy to respond to anybody's questions because it should be something that we deliberate on uh, and we deliberate on a collective basis. So thank you for your time and your attention. Peter, thank you. Can you hear us, Peter? I can hear you and I'm going to increase my volume just a little bit to make sure. Got it. Sure. Um, I think I'll just go first and give people some time to put some questions. Uh, and when you talk about um, an epistemology of ignorance, um, isn't there also an epistemology of indifference? Yeah. And a great question, right? And, and one thing we have to start realizing is that there are multiple causes, and these multiple causes are reinforcing, right? And, and they're interrelated. Um, so definitely 
uh, uh, indifference is, is a huge factor, right? Uh, but indifference is happening much more in the, the sort of, of, of conscious mind, right? I, I need to be aware of something before I can be indifferent, right? It's even a stronger mode of social control and social reproduction if I can even hide the issue that I'm indifferent from in ways that I don't even have to think about it, right? And in many ways, through the construction of, of white suburban space, and I just underline that notion of white, and that's linked to the white flight, we have created communities that never have to even go into the city of Detroit uh, or recognize that there's anybody in their lived experience on a day-to-day -day level that doesn't look just like them, right? And so in, in, in some bizarre way, indifference is better than ignorance, right? Because at least indifference hopefully is going to eat at the heart and the soul, right? Whereas ignorance lets me be blissful uh, and live in this world of, of racial injustice without even being aware of its existence, right? right. Uh, and again, it's a little oversimplified, but we have to start thinking about how, how these different things are interrelated, also respecting the fact that the brain can hold multiple inconsistent thoughts at the same time, right? So I can be ignorant in one part of my mind and indifferent in another. So it's, it's, a, it's complicated, but we gotta start understanding the, the sort of cognitive science of race, right? As much as we have to understand uh, the physics of the social production and reproduction uh, of spatial racism. Thank you, that's helpful. Other questions? Thoughts that we have for Peter? We can even do folks on, um, on Zoom as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm now having a little trouble hearing. So if somebody, if you could just repeat the question. Uh, we don't have a question yet, but I was offering it up if anybody does, um, including online as well. Um, you can please look, please unmute yourself. I'd also say it's, it's okay if you're processing, right? Because that's a lot of information and, and, and these are not things we necessarily have a lot of experience or shared space to, to process, right? So if, if your mind is busy processing, that is just as healthy as if you're formulating a question. Well, yes, my name is Steve Bancroft. There we go. My name is Steve Bancroft. Uh, I'm priest associate here, but was formerly the dean of the cathedral down in Detroit. Uh, and I came here from Houston, Texas back in 1995 with the primary concept of helping to redevelop uh, the city of Detroit which I had been doing in Houston prior to coming here. Um, and your maps are absolutely accurate. I mean, and, and I'll be honest with you, the biggest shock of my life was coming here and discovering the, the incredible uh, racial divide that even a place like Houston doesn't have. Um, and and the, what I would call an almost prideful attitude uh, from both sides in regard to that divide. Uh, and the fact that there's 142 municipalities in the metropolitan area, I found this stunningly, uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. And it just makes things so much harder, so much more difficult to do. So I have devoted until, even after I retired from the cathedral, I, I continue to devote the effort to try to redevelop uh, areas in Detroit and did it on a private basis. And one of the struggles, and you're absolutely correct, I think there was some intentionality, redlining is still going on in Detroit. I know that for a fact, because I was trying to produce uh, housing that could get mortgages. And I will tell you, getting a mortgage in Detroit is, is really, really difficult. But what is also difficult, to put it bluntly, is that I had a great deal of money to bring to Detroit and it was hard to bring it. I would just tell you it was very difficult uh, to find places willing to accept outside money. Um, there's an attitude that some, and I can appreciate it. I can appreciate the feeling that somehow or another, if you bring money, you're going to cheat somebody or you're gonna take some property that, you know, uh, gentrification, I can go through the whole gamut of things that take place, but it became 
so incredibly difficult to do, to bring investment into Detroit and to actually accomplish things. I would like your reaction to that and, and what you have seen about it and what can we do about it? Yeah, and again, great questions. And I always like to, to acknowledge uh, the, the, the wisdom that's in a room. I mean, the, the, just look around you uh, and think about how powerful you all are individually and collectively. Right? And I say that in part because we're gonna to need to access that power to, to, to make notions of change. Um, and there's a whole lot of rich aspects of, 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 of your comment and, and question. Uh, one is, is just the history of accidents in history uh, that uh, in what was the Northwest Territory, uh, which is why Michigan can say that they're, they're the victors of the West, which somebody who grew up in, in Washington State never quite understood, um, uh, that they have very inelastic boundaries, right? So that map I showed with the, just that, you know, outrageously large number of, of townships and municipalities uh, is, is very rigid, right? Whereas other parts of the country, including the South, and I think of, of, of Charlotte in North Carolina, I think of Houston in Texas, uh, would have a very different story of, of, of if they had Detroit's laws, uh, and Detroit would have a very different history presently if we had uh, the same home rule laws that are in North Carolina or Texas. So what happens in other parts of the country, you have that white flight, uh, you have that expanding growth into the suburbs, uh, and the city just annex you, right? Uh, and then you have more white flight, and then, well, they annex you again, and more white flight, and they annex you again. Uh, so the city grows, right? Uh, which is one of the reasons why Houston and, and, and Charlotte are so huge, right? And why uh, Detroit, uh, uh, relatively speaking, if you look at the city itself, but not the region has shrunk in terms of population. Uh, and that creates a very different dynamic. It says you can run, but you can't hide. It doesn't mean that the issues of, of race are resolving themselves, but it changes dramatically the political context in which the racial conflict and, and, and resolution of, 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 of is, is negotiated, right? Uh, uh, so in, in Detroit, in Southeast Michigan, if I get across eight mile, uh, I'm in a different world, right? I can control my own resources. I can engage in what they call resource hoarding. I can engage in all sorts of exclusionary zoning and other practices. So as where uh, in the neighborhood level, when you had those neighborhood associations using physical violence and vigilante tactics, right? That was unlawful. But the minute they cross eight mile, they become the mayor, right? They became the, the city council. Right? And they could then use state power and state authority to reinforce those racial boundaries far more effectively uh, and invisibly uh, than the neighborhood associations that were trying to get Dr. Sweets uh, out of his neighborhood. And so that's sort of one dynamic that we can start to unpack and really get a better sense of the physics of this resegregation. Uh, and if we don't understand a problem, we can't try to solve it. Right, so the, the Houston and Detroit are, 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 are interestingly different for many reasons that should come to bear to our analysis of, of how we respond to Detroit. Okay. To the question that you raise, uh, that notion of, of high levels of distrust, right, is, is a very real phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, and, and skepticism on Detroiters part about anybody who wants to come and say that we're going to, to develop and redevelop, right? If you remember, uh, I-75 was, was, was a redevelopment project. Right, that destroyed uh, uh, the, the most densely packed area. Right? A lot of attention was given to, Houston, or to Tulsa over the summer on the 100th anniversary of, of, of the destruction of Black Wall Street. Well, there's a lot of similarities between you know, the, the destruction of, of Paradise Valley and, and, and what took place in, 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 in Tulsa. Uh, so the question, if I reframe it, would be, how do we start to rebuild trust? Right? Uh, and, and one of my mentors, who's, who's a, sadly uh, uh, transitioned, uh, Mama Lila Cabell would used to say that, that, that racial equity work moves at the speed of relationships, right? And it's going to take time, but it's taking investing in relationships to build that trust, to enable the ability to collaborate across these imaginary uh, geopolitical boundaries, right? Uh, as well as this question of where do the ideas come from? You know, something that I've been taught at the Key Center uh, when I go into community is, is, is not to go in with my own ideas, but to go in and ask, what do you need? Right? Uh, and really trying to be working from the base of, of, of what they need and what their idea of progress and development and stability and a good life is. Uh, and what people can imagine for themselves uh, in different neighborhoods of Detroit might be very different from what people at a national level or even a regional level uh, imagine what is good for them. Right? And uh, it's, it's not very helpful trying to get somebody to have a different worldview. 
uh, uh, I think you really have to work with, with inside what they envision their future that they want uh, and to, to build uh, trust through building relationships is, is the way I would try to rephrase it. And that's not easy. I mean, giving it the true name does not make it easier, but it lets us be uh, more intentional with our actions. Um, I'm from India originally. I've been here as an international student at the University of Chicago. And uh, uh, the program uh, initially had us stay with three different families before we entered the full student at the, at the university. And what I found then was I stayed with a Jewish family and to all American families in the suburbs, very, very American with very beautiful children and the kindest people you could meet anywhere. But after I left the university, that's when you really encounter as a brown skin or whatever category one is in, that um, discrimination and so on, was alive and well, and most of us uh, were in denial. To us, America was a great, a wonderful country, and the best protection, it would seem, you know, is uh, to be in denial. I worked at Sinai Hospital for many, many years uh, before I went into full-scale teaching at a university. But what I learned is that no matter which small group you had, they all had their different kinds of uh, ideas about discrimination and where the borders were and how you survived. And most of all, how did you survive well without falling apart with all the stuff that was. So you go into this denial system. And now um, in this old age kind of uh, field where you get a different perspective of things, I am truly, truly frightened by what happened January 6th, because I think this is a different ball game than anything that this country has observed uh, before. This is a violence that in the institutions, the police department, and other places that we have full trust in, we find that there are so many people who are, in quotes, uh, white supremacists. And I'm not trying to be critical or anything. I'm trying to find out how do you teach students because, or uh, clients, if, um, you know, if you're in one of the therapeutic um, professions, how do you uh, get them to still keep the idealism that America represents to the world and not understand what is happening and how darned hateful it and hurtful it is? I hope I'm not. No, so I want to, I want to thank you for your question and, and for sharing you know, your own challenges and struggles, which are, are not easy. Um, so I, I wanna say a little bit about how we can think about multiracial coalitions, and then I'll address this issue of, of rising white nationalism. Uh, at the center, uh, uh, one of our most important programs is the Detroit Equity Action Lab or the DEAL, uh, which is a leadership development program for folks that uh, uh, are committed to, to, to dismantling uh, spatial structural racism. And one of our previous fellows name is, is Tawana Petty, and, and we've adopted Tawana's framework, which she has developed uh, of, of co-liberation. Right? And it provides a framework to start thinking about uh, of, of how we can come together in a struggle for co-liberation, recognizing that we're coming from very different entry points. Right? So somebody who is an immigrant from India is uh, very different than somebody who uh, 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 is uh, uh, a descendant of slaves, who is different from somebody who's an immigrant from Africa or the Caribbean, who is different from uh, you know, somebody coming out of, of Vietnam or Cambodia or the Middle East. Right? Uh, and, and another thing that, that is, 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 is true from the work that we've learned is that inside of, of many of those communities, including the African-American community, uh, is internalized racism, right, and, and deep strands of, of anti-Blackness, right? So how do we struggle 
uh, uh, with that force that, that pollutes every race, white, black, you know, uh, uh, Indian, Middle Eastern. Uh, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, what we call the inside of caucuses, right? So uh, inside of your own community. Uh, and then there needs to be, which is sort of bonding work. Uh, and then there needs to be work that is done between communities, which is sort of the bridging work, right? Uh, and, and there are good framework like uh, Tawana Petty's of, of co-liberation that I think can, can let us think uh, about how we might approach that work in, a, in, a, in an effective and sophisticated way. Uh, but it is a struggle. It's not just a black and white struggle. It's a struggle of thinking about uh, how are we building a, a vision of, 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 of you know, a, a, a true pluralistic America. Um, uh, and, and I would go to Tawana's work and, and, and uh, that notion of collaboration is, is something to look further at. In terms of, of the rising white nationalism, you know, uh, I never would have thought it would happen in my lifetime, right? Uh, I was kind of in my own blissful ignorance of thinking that uh, uh, some of these things are getting better, or at least that we've driven them down where it was not done in polite society. Uh, and it used to be what we call dog whistle politics, and, and now it's bullhorn politics. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't have a good answer to what's causing it. Um, one book I teach in my seminar, uh, Reimagining Development in Detroit, is John Powell's book, Racing to Justice. Uh, and in the introduction of John's book, he talks about this notion of American exceptionalism uh, of, is really being reflective of, of an isolated white soul, right? Uh, and is really sort of grounding this notion of, of the absence of, of solidarity and communitarian values uh, and, and kind of explores what does it mean when entire countries of, of mythical roots of founding fathers is, is ultimately born not only of the enlightenment, but of slavery uh, and the kind of, of, of cognitive illness, uh, almost existential illness that that creates within white people, uh, unique to America. It's not reproduced all over with, with all white folks. Uh, and, and the grounding of that is, I think, the basis of what we're seeing now is, is what happens when that isolated white soul is, is, is under pressure. Uh, pressure with change in demography, changes with globalization, changes with deindustrialization. Uh, and how does that unhealthy, isolated white soul respond? Uh, and that is the kind of intuition that, that I hold to try to understand empathetically uh, uh, and diagnostically what's taking place with this rise of white supremacy. Uh, and uh, uh, it could be the death throes of a, of a dying sort of worldview of white uh, uh, nationalism and white supremacy, or it could be a resurgence, right? Um, uh, and, and I don't think anybody should fool ourselves, right? I, I think that we need to take that as a real threat uh, and to think creatively, uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, with levels of empathy and compassion uh, about how we can bring uh, even those folks over time, and that's, a, again, I think what's the right time horizon uh, into what John Powell also calls the expanding circle of human concern, right? But it's, um, it needs to be viewed as a threat. It needs to be studied and analyzed. Uh, and we need to be thinking at, at multiple different levels how we are going to, uh, it's like a cancer. How do you uh, 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 get rid of exercise this cancer? To what extent is it done through surgery? To what extent do we need radiation? To what extent do we need chemotherapy or multiple tools? Uh, to, to control this raging cancer. Uh, any questions online? I would ask, Peter, I would ask, uh, are you optimistic for the future? What is your, your crystal ball tell me? Right? Yeah, I, I, you can't do this work if, 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 if not at a root level, you're an optimist. But, but as Derek Bell used to say, part of that is willing to just engage in the struggle, regardless of outcome. Right? So, so one level of, of motivation is saying that this is uh, another thing that, 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 that Coleman Young used to say, if you find a, a good fight, get in it. Uh, I know this is a good fight, right? And, and I want to be hopeful, uh, but I also want to, to be acknowledging the, the severity of, of the threats and the challenges. Um, but I'll also say, if, if you're actually working in community, uh, uh, you find just amazing folks, right? I, I've heard amazing voices come out of this room, right? And uh, the work that we do with the, with the DEAL program lets me meet uh, some of the people on the front lines of this struggle and work with them and struggle with them. Uh, and, and that gives me hope, right? Uh, these are broad, large structural challenges. Um, and I'm coming to a, a place in my own mind uh, that acknowledges that the existing 
template of politics and economics in America cannot solve it, right? So I think part of the solution is got to be imagining, first imagining, because if you can't imagine it, you can't work towards it, um, what would be fundamentally a, a more just economy, right? What fundamentally would get at the roots of inequality, which means as questioning uh, the, the, the sort of, 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 of fetishized notion of private property we have. Uh, I've just finished Thomas Piketty's book on, on, on capitalism and ideology, and it provides some, some pretty nice alternative frameworks of how we can reconceive of that American exceptionalized view of, of, of property as mine forever for all my generations. Uh, and some very basic things such as going back and raising the inheritance tax, right? Uh, having a, a more progressive taxation, uh, having taxes on wealth, uh, uh, things that are not conceived possible in our current politics uh, are really the path forward if we're gonna start building a, a, a shared uh, a community uh, where resources are, are gonna be uh, uh, available to make opportunity uh, structures and infrastructures accessible to you no matter what zip code uh, you happen to be born into. And I guess the final question I'd like to ask, what can, uh, what can congregations like ours do to be allies here? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, you're, you're, you're starting education and awareness. And I think that's critically important. Uh, uh, but if you go back into that, that dialectic I spoke of between beliefs and institutions, um, we have to have a fundamental reshaping of the American uh, belief system, that isolated white soul, right? Uh, and when we do our sort of brainstorming in our classes and our seminars and, and our strategizing space, uh, there's only a few levers that can change belief systems, right? I mean, you can think about what can a family do? You got to have a media strategy, um, but religion, right, is, is one of those important levers that can start to reshape belief systems, not only at an individual level, but at a mass scale. So I would also just sort of think not only is the good work I'm hearing coming out of here that you, 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 you partner with people in community, you build relationships, you have shared experiences, right? That's one path that a, a parish can do and should do. But there's a sort of deeper sort of question about how relying upon uh, the, the sort of, of deep authentic aspects of, of your faith, right? Uh, you can also imagine how you can change collectively uh, within uh, St. David's Parish, but then within the Episcopal tradition and then within the, the Christian tradition, uh, the, the, the fundamental beliefs that are really reflected in the gospel, right? And, and, and take those beliefs seriously and say, uh, what does that mean about uh, property? What does that mean about public transportation? What does that mean about uh, making sure that people have a, a guaranteed annual income? You know, what does that mean for access to health care? Uh, you know, all of those questions, I think, are, are at one level deeply religious questions. Uh, and, and I think uh, it will be uh, uh, people on the vanguard uh, of, of, of a religion, and I think in my own mind in a, in a, a very sort of interfaith complex, right, uh, that will be part of the leadership to be reshaping the belief systems uh, towards what Dr. King was calling the beloved community, right, and, and that's a lot of work, but that's, that's religious work. All right. Um, somebody was wanting to know if the presentation will be available after the session. I'm happy to share that with with, with you, Father Chris, and you, Des, and, and give it to anybody. This is, uh, I, I believe, in public. That would be great. Yeah, if you, if you want to go ahead and, uh, and email it, because even us in the room here had a hard time seeing the fonts. Uh, but yeah, just email it to us, and, and we'd be happy to put it on the parish website. Great. I will do that. Any other questions for Peter before we go here? Peter, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you as always, and we really, um, we really value our relationship, our partnership with you, as we uh, we seek to play our part in becoming um, part of that beloved community. So, your hands together for uh, our guest, Peter Cameron, today. Uh, thank you, Peter, and we will see you soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful okay. Sunday. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Peter.